It's a privilege um, that I'm, I'm particularly pleased to take on for two reasons. One, because of the quality of the work that you are about to hear, um, which I think is outstanding. Uh, but second, because I have a strong paternali paternalist interest, or paternalistic interest, I should say. No, paternal would be better. A paternal interest uh, uh, in, uh, in some of the characters you are about to hear, um, along with um, some of the other uh, possible parents uh, in the audience, and Don Jordan from World in Action. Um, who, uh, and you'll be hearing more about that uh, in time to come. Um, one or two uh, housekeeping announcements. They have rather an elaborate evacuation procedure for, uh, for fire in the, uh, in the context of this, this particular building. Um, I'll tell you all about that if it looks like being happened to be. I, guess. <laughs> <laughs> I may be able to tell you in time. I may not, <laughs> one way or another. Um, and um, we're going to, John is going to um, speak for uh, about 40 minutes, uh, and then we have two very distinguished respondents, Holly Toynbee and Holly Sutherland, uh, and they will give their reactions, um, and then there'll be time for some uh, Q&A. And um, we will finish uh, on at 8 o'clock. Uh, there will be a reception afterwards um, at 8 o'clock. And also that um, the books will be on sale, uh, the book itself will be on sale, um, outside, uh, and uh, John has kindly agreed that he will sign uh, any uh, profit as appropriate. But I think without further ado, I think let's um, get on with hearing about good times from John Hills. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Julian, and um, thank you all for coming. Now, I do have one immediate announcement. If you have come here under the impression that you are either going to hear Led Zeppelin um, or LSE alumnus uh, Mick Jagger singing their versions of Good Times, Bad Times, you're actually in the wrong place. Um, so please quietly leave now or maybe stay and enjoy it. Um, I really need to start with a lot of thanks. Um, the idea of this book was to bring together um, a lot of work um, done within the Centre for Analysis of Social Exclusion, where I work, um, by myself and colleagues over the last 10 years, and done by a lot of other people, and try and bring that to a wider audience. So if you look at the acknowledgements inside the book, um, you'll see there are a very large number of names there of people that I've been lucky enough to collaborate with um, over the last 10, 15 years, um, and other people whose work I've, I've drawn on. Um, I also need to thank, as, as you will see, uh, once the first slide comes up, um, I need to thank the Economic and Social Research Council, um, who funded the fellowship, um, the idea of which was to produce this book. Um, I also actually need to think, thank the Department of Social Policy for giving me, um, as the ESRC money ran out, um, the Department of Social Policy for giving me a partial sabbatical to actually write the book um, in the last academic year. Um, but also, the idea of the book was to try and bring some of that research evidence to a somewhat wider audience than might normally be reading um, some academic output. And part of the inspiration for the way in which the book tries to do that is, as Julian uh, almost mentioned, um, a, actually a television program uh, that happened, um, was broadcast uh, just over 25 years ago which always struck me, that was shortly after I arrived at the LSE, and it always struck me as a, a brilliant way of getting across um, social science research. Um, this was a program that was devised in combination by Julian, um, my colleague, and by uh, Don Jordan, World in Action, who's in the front row there, World in Action producer, um, who came up with the idea that the best way of explaining to people how the welfare state works was to have a game show hosted by Nicholas Parsons. Um, this was the, uh, if, I wish this was on YouTube or something, because it's well worth watching. I don't know whether that's allowed these days, uh, whether that's possible. But um, the idea was to play the game of sponges, to find out who were the biggest sponges on the state. And in this game show hosted by Nicholas Parsons, um, the Osborne family from Alderley Edge in Cheshire 
Stephen, an accountant, I can't remember what Henrietta was, was doing at the time, uh, were pitted against the um, Ackroyd family from Salford, um, Jim, a forklift truss, truck driver. Um, and the idea of the game was to find out who won if you looked across the whole lifetime from, um, from the welfare state. It also featured, and he's running rapidly to avoid this photograph at the moment, <laughs> every so often somebody popped up to explain what was going on, this rather young-looking um, um, professor um, um, who, um, who was one of the boffins who had produced the, um, uh, produ produced the numbers behind him. Now, so what I've done to introduce the analysis of the big data and the large amounts of research that feature in the, um, in, in the book is I've gone back, um, inspired partly by um, another long-running TV series, the 7-Up TV series, I've gone back to find out what has happened to the Ackroyds and the Osbournes, these entirely invented families, 25 years on. So we've discovered what's happened to their children and what's happened to their grandchildren. Um, so here... Um, Stephen and Henrietta, we knew about them. We actually knew about their, their daughter, Charlotte, and Henry. They were at school when, uh, back in 1989, uh, and, and again, actually, in the follow-up program uh, that we were involved with called Beat the Tax Man, um, that was done a couple of years later. Um, the, the Osbournes won Beat the Tax Man, I have to say. Um, no surprise there. Um, and it turns out um, Hen Henry is now married, um, the son, to, to Charlotte's a civil servant these days, young civil servant. Um, Henry, these days, is married to Claire. They have two children, um, and they also have a, a, a young son born last year called Edward. Um, the Ackroyd family is a slightly larger extended family. Jim and Tracy, um, their children, Michelle and Gary. Michelle was for a while with Wayne, but Wayne sadly is no longer with her. Um, so she's now a single parent with her daughter, Chloe. Um, Gary um, is now married to Denise, um, and they, you'll hear a bit more about their life in a moment. And then they had a, a, a late um, further child, Paul, who's um, recently gone to university. Um, and, and Gary and Denise have two children. They, um, like, um, like um, Henry and Claire, had a child last July, in July 2013. And given what was in the news at the time, they decided to call their, um, their son George. Um, for some reason, the Osbournes did not decide to call their son George. Um, um, anyway, moving rapidly on to Mr. Osborne, um, part of the point of the book, or part of the context for the book, which is talking about what we know about how people's lives change from detailed examination of long-term survey data, this runs up against the way in which the debate is posed about what's happening in the welfare state, who benefits, in some ways not so different from the debate that was raging 25 years ago when the original Sponges program was made. And this is um, a, a quote from a different Osborne, from George Osborne, but there are many others. Um, I could have quoted some Labour politicians in, in the book. Also, there are some quotations from Ian Duncan Smith. This is, I think, become so pervasive, this idea, that you hardly notice it when it's said. The idea that two groups need to be satisfied with our welfare system. Those who need it, who are old, who are vulnerable, who are disabled, who've lost their job, and who we, as a compassionate society, want to support. But there's a second group, the people who pay for this system, who go out to work, who pay their taxes and expect it to be fair on them too. Two groups, uh, them and us often described as strivers and skivers, um, or shirkers. Um, the people we hear about, but actually terribly hard to find, um, the three generations who've never worked against hard-working families, uh, the people who have their curtains drawn in mid-morning um, against alarm clock Britain. Um, I gather that in Australia, th this is known as the lifters and the leaners. Um, so the idea of this is that there are, there are these two groups, unchanging with very different interests. But the evidence suggests it's not like that. Um, now, if you start with a snapshot of what's going on at one moment, 
you can see something that might bear out this idea of them and us. This is what was happening to Henry and Claire Osborne in 2010. Henry is a, a young um, solicitor. Um, his wife um, is um, a teacher working um, part-time uh, because they've recently had, had a child who's now two years old in, in 2010. Um, between them after they paid their pension contributions, um, they're earning £53,000. I don't know whether it's... Can people see the pictures at the back? Or it's, can somebody do something to the lights? I've tried. I've asked about the lights, but they, uh, they're filming. So the problem... Oh, dear. Well, I, yes, I, OK. I'll, I'll try my best, then. But um, they pay between them £12,900 in, in direct taxes. They do, at this point, they wouldn't anymore, get a tax credit of £545. They were getting child benefit. Um, this would be cut back today of, of £1,000. And they pay, but they pay council tax of £2,000. Um, and they pay indirect taxes of another £7,000. But their child is only two, so isn't getting any after school, uh, preschool, nursery, or any, um, uh, isn't in primary school. But they do benefit from the National Health Service. If you add it all up, they're paying £16,000 more into um, the state um, than they're getting out of it. If you contrast that with Michelle Ackroyd, the single parent, she's working 16 hours a week in a supermarket on a pretty low wage, not absolutely the minimum wage, um, but she takes home after national insurance contributions nearly £6,000. And at this point, she was getting nearly £3,000 in, in, in child tax credit, £1,000 like, um, like Henry Michelle in child benefit. She was also getting a working tax credit um, because, because she was in work, and she was getting some housing benefit. She's not an owner occupier. She's, a, she's a, um, a tenant of a housing association in Salford. Um, and she's paying a bit of her council tax um, and, and some indirect taxes, but she also benefits from the NHS. And if you add in the value of a primary school place in Salford, uh, she's getting about £10,000 out of that. So she is getting £16,000 out of the state um, in, the, in that year. So if you look at it like that, this is the state acting as a kind of Robin Hood, transferring money from the comparatively well-off Henry and Claire to the much less well-off, but still actually quite hard-working, uh, Michelle Ackroyd. I mean, all, all the same, at the end of it, um, Henry and Claire are still considerably better off um, than Michelle. Um, that's what you see if you do a snapshot. But as Julian pointed out, and as I'm really only elaborating on this evening, um, if you... Um, um, I'm sorry, the, 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 this is the picture you see if you look, if you look more generally. Um, this is across the whole population, not across made-up people. Um, you see um, at the top of the diagram there, if you can see it peering out of the gloom, um, the top bars are what we get out, what, what each family in each tenth of the income distribution, with the poorest on the left, the richest on the right, get out of the system on the top. And you'll see there's a hump there. They're concentrated on people in about the second or third tenth of the income distribution. Uh, but still people in the top half get quite a lot out of, um, out of pensions, out of the NHS, out of education, um, in black at the bottom of the bar. And at the bottom I've got what people pay into it. And even at the bottom, although people might not be paying very much national insurance or income tax, they're still putting money in through indirect taxes. But of course, with much higher incomes at the top, and taxes in, in total taking much the same share of everybody's income, whether they're rich or poor, the people at the top are putting more in. And so we do have this redistributive effect of what's going on. And in fact, actually, if you look at it, the redistributive effect of the UK welfare state is slightly greater than the redistributive effect of the Swedish welfare state. Um, so in that sense, Robin Hood is doing his job. The problem is that the gap between, if you like, the Sheriff of Nottingham and everybody else in Britain is so much wider than it is in a country like Sweden that we still end up, even after that redistribution, as being one of the most unequal countries in the industrialised world. But that's just what's happening at a point in time. And what Julian and colleagues were pointing out is that over the lifetime, it looks very different, particularly because most of the money goes on pensions, on health care, and on education, which pretty well everybody benefits from. And these are the original numbers that were featured in the, um, in the Sponges program, but I've updated them to 2010 earnings terms. And I think the key point to see there is that um, Stephen and Henrietta were getting £509,000 in today's money, half a million pounds out of the welfare state. 
and for good, program, for good measure the program threw in the tax relief on their mortgage, that no longer exists, and some other things like the benefits of going to the opera and rail subsidies and things like that. Um, if you added that up, uh, by the end of the programme, they were the winners in terms of getting most out of it. Although it has to be remembered that they were paying a lot more tax across their whole lifetimes. By, by contrast, although Jim and Tracy won the round of the programme that was about cash benefits, um, it's not that Stephen Henry had got nothing because they were getting child benefit, but, but Jim had periods of unemployment and so on. Um, and uh, they didn't get as much out of pensions because, like the average um, higher income person, Stephen and Henrietta live longer to collect their pensions than, than Jim and Tracy. Um, and they were getting at that point less out of the school system because their children left school at 16, whereas the Osborne children went on to university. Um, in all, stopping in the middle of this, they were getting £535,000 um, out of the welfare state. Um, but they were paying less in tax. On the other hand, over their lifetime, the, the Osborns had an income, lifetime income that was three, three times as high as that of the Ackroyds. Now, just going back, if you look at today's numbers, these are, these are numbers... Um, uh, oh, sorry, let me move on. Sorry, move on. No, that's it. Um, to this, if you take exactly the same numbers as I put up before as to where, where the benefits and the, the taxes come from, but split it across age groups rather than um, by, uh, by income group, you get a picture that looks like this, which I think when you think about it makes a lot of sense. On top there, we've got what we get out of it, um, depending on the, uh, the age of um, what's quaintly called the house household reference person. The, I'll go into that afterwards if you're really interested. Um, um, the, 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 the older member of the household, usually. Um, and that, there's a bulge when people are in their 40s, um, when people are getting um, cash benefits for children, children going through school, that's the big black, uh, that's why the, the black hump rises. But the really large amount of money comes, um, comes after retirement through both pensions and you'll see the rising green bar of, 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 of the NHS there. Taxes, on the other hand, peak um, with incomes when people are in their late 40s. And after that, I'm afraid, for those of you who are over 50, it's all downhill. Um, but on the other hand, the good side of this is downhill in terms of the taxes you pay as well. If you were to cut this off um, at the age of 59, and you had a household which had started at the beginning of this diagram and worked its way through, these are figures from um, 2005, and what you would find is that by the time um, they got to 60, what they had paid in towards the welfare state was about two houses worth of taxes in today's house prices on average. What they'd got out of it was only one and a half taxes worth, uh, one, and, one and a half houses worth of benefits. So they'd be out of pocket by really a considerable amount of money. But on the other hand, after retirement, it comes back. And by the end of the process, what we're talking about in today's money with today's system, rather larger than, um, in terms of its scale than, than 25 years ago, is the equivalent of about three houses. A typical household would be paying in over its lifetime about three houses worth of taxes towards the welfare state and getting about three houses worth of uh, pensions and NHS and, and so on um, back. Um, so what the state does is a kind of flattening exercise so that when we're before, oh, this is, these are average figures of course, before retirement age we're paying money in and afterwards we're getting uh, net ban benefits um, back out. So looked at from that perspective, a lot, not all, of what the welfare state does um, is, to, is this kind of life cycle savings bank redistribution rather than um, rather than um, the, the Robin Hood job. It still does a Robin Hood job, but a, a rather attenuated form once you allow for that. Now, under the last government, uh, the extent to which that was going on was actually increased. The priorities of the last government were um, services, health care and education, benefiting children and older people um, more than others, and as far as cash benefits were concerned, it was benefits and tax credits for families with children, and it was pensions. There was very little the last government did by way of cash benefits for people um, of, of um, working age. Since 2010, since the election, that's changed somewhat. Because if you look at what's happening um, at the bottom end of the, the, uh, the life cycle, it's true that school spending has been protected 
um, within the cuts. But on the other hand, there have been cuts to child benefit, there have been cuts to child tax credits, um, there are um, education maintenance allowances have been cut, um, youth provision has been in the front line of, um, of, of many of the local authority cuts. If you look at people of working age, the, the income tax allowance has gone up. But on the other hand, most of the cuts in the benefit system have been concentrated on people of working age. And there's a whole list there, but I won't go through them all. Um, on the, by contrast with that, state pensions have been protected, um, as has the NHS, although we know, all know the demands are rising, and so have things like winter fuel payments, free bus passes, and so on. Although, to set against that, um, local authority care for the elderly have been cut. Famously, the age allowance um, in income tax was, was cut, the, the famous granny tax, a few budgets ago. And if you're near retirement, state pension ages are rising, although that's partly reflecting um, increased longevity. So this picture of the extent to which the welfare state is redistributing across the life cycle is changing with more emphasis on, I think, the redistribution towards um, older people and less towards families with children um, and the children themselves, of course. Now, that's taking the big picture. What I try to do, the long-term picture, what I try to do in the book is to look at other, other evidence we've got about different scales, different time scales of, of what's going on. And, this starts with a little story about what's happening to um, um, Charlotte Osborne, the civil servant, um, in her early 30s. She's a civil servant. I don't know which department she's in. Maybe it's the Department for Work and Pensions. But Charlotte, like me, has a really quite dull life if you look at her income across the year. It, it stays very much the same until maybe in August there's a 1% pay rise, maybe in September there's um, an, an annual increment. So if you look at her monthly income for her as a single person after tax, um, it doesn't change very much over the year. It's a very stable pattern. And the same will be true of many academics as well. The world we imagine is one where if you take a snapshot, um, that would be represent what, what's happening to you across, across the year. It's a bit more complicated for a lot of other people. Uh, this is what's happening to Gary and Denise. Gary is a van driver. Denise um, uh, works um, in a school canteen. As a result of that, she's only paid during school terms and isn't paid in half terms. So, and uh, they're also receiving tax credits. These, this is the picture of how their life was in 2010. I'll come back to why in, uh, later on. Um, in April, they were getting £11,050. But in May, there was a half term, so they had a bit less coming in. Also, Gary's hours um, were down a bit. And he's not even on a zero hours contract, but they were, they were still down a bit. Um, and then in August, um, things were way down. Um, his hours were down. Life was quieter in August. She wasn't paid at all by the school in August. Um, and this is something we saw in our own, own, own research a few years ago. Um, but then in September she was back at, uh, the school was running again, the school dinners were running again, um, he had more hours, and also their tax credit adjustment came through. So part of the variation in their life, and this very rapid variation up and down, is itself in some cases driven by the way the benefit and tax credit system itself works. But it's quite complicated. Now that's, these are just made up people illustrating the point. But when we surveyed um, 100 families, uh, this is now 10 years ago we did it, and it would be extremely interesting to, to repeat this. Um, we followed them week by week through the year, taking detailed information on how their income varied from week to week. We expected that the, the people we, we looked at were people who were entitled to tax credits because they had children and, and below, below average income. So these were working families, they were in work, but and with below average income and, and with children. We expected quite a lot of them to have incomes like Charlotte or me that were flat with a kind of step in it over the year. Actually, very few of them were like that. More people had this kind of highly erratic pattern, driven by all sorts of things, including switches between, between jobs in cases, including in some cases family breakup, um, including just a lot of stuff that goes on, a lot of stuff that happens um, in people's lives. 
Those are families, we were looking at families in work, and only a few of them lost their jobs, but I think we're used to hearing about people who are out of work. Um, and th this is what you would see, this is what you see if you look at people who lose their jobs and start claiming job seekers allowance. I think the public imagination is that somebody on job seekers allowance will be staying on it for a long time because we've all heard about the long-term unemployed. Now, the, um, the red line here is how many months people who started a spell on job seekers allowance stayed on it. That's back before the crisis in 2007. Um, the other two lines, which are just a little bit higher, um, show what the position was for people starting in April 2009 and April 2011, in other words, much more recently, what's happened to them over the last two years. If you look at any of those lines, uh, fewer than half of people who start a Job Seekers Allowance spell stay on Job Seekers Allowance for more than two months. There's a very large amount of turnover. Every quarter in Britain, whether it's time of recession or time of boom, about a million people lose work and a million people gain work. So the typical picture of somebody who's moved on to Job Seekers Allowance is not somebody who's going to stay on for a long time. Of course, some people do, but not that many. And of course, they make up a bigger percentage of the people you see at, at any one time. Um, but even now, after the recession, um, only about a tenth of people stay on Job Seekers Allowance for longer than a year. Actually, it's quite difficult because you'll be moved on to other things and all sorts of other things might happen to you. But the early decay, if you like, in this curve, showing the turnover, uh, isn't so much driven by the administration. Um, now, that's about what happens from week to week. But we also know, from the analysis done by people like Stephen Jenkins and others in the audience, um, what happens when you follow it from year to year using data from things like the British Household Panel study. Um, we also know what happened to um, the Osbournes and the, um, and, and the Ackroyds um, in the 2000s because this was predicted um, by um, Don and Julian in their programme 25 years ago um, and they correctly forecast that Stephen would have heart attacks in 2002 and 2003. Now, Stephen, by 2001, was a company doctor. He was really very well paid. Um, they were in the top 1% of the income distribution. After his um, first heart attack, he, he had some time off work. After his second heart attack, he, he had a longer time off work. And he decided to downshift um, and um, work for a more regular accountancy firm where he didn't have to do so much international travel. So their income did fall really quite a lot um, after that. But they still stayed within the top 2% all the way through um, the, uh, the 2000s. Um, for Jim and Tracy, it was very different. And a lot of this is driven by what happened to their family size. With the extra child arriving, with, um, with um, earlier on, and then with um, their older children moving out, and then in Michelle's case, after Wayne left her, moving back in again. Um, but then when she moved out and when uh, their, their elder son started bringing money in because he was still living at home, um, they reached a point where actually as a family um, they were halfway up the income distribution. But then at that point Jim lost his job. And that plunged them for a couple of years despite moving back into work temporarily. Uh, for a couple of years uh, they were on benefits, uh, they were um, uh, the 11th percentile of the income distribution, pretty well um, the, 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 just above the poorest tenth. But then times got better and um, Jim got a job again, fairly similar to the one he had before, and their children left home and eventually actually um, their youngest son, um, Ryan, became the first member of the family to go on to university, leaving them as empty nesters with very much the same earnings as they'd always had, but now um, above the middle of the income distribution, um, sharing it just between the two of them. Now, that kind of variation up and down is actually what you see in the, in the data. Um, these are some of um, Stephen's numbers from the, um, from the British Household Panel Study. Life varies a lot. <laughs> And some of these ups and downs will be caused precisely by uh, the arrival of very young people. Um, this is from a very restricted group of people. These are simply, this is what happens to the incomes, the family incomes, of women who were born in 1966, following them through from when they were 25 to when they were 44, I think. And you'll see 
It's a huge tangle. There is one woman you can see right at the top there who actually has a pretty stable um, six or seven years, right at the top, the, the richest person in the sample. This is a log scale, by the way, for those of you interested in these things. But then she plunges down to join everybody else, to join the tangle of the variation that we see in people's incomes from year to year, even when we restrict it to a group of people who are of the same age. Now, that has really quite important, uh, important implications when we think about things like poverty. Um, the good news is that it means that not many people are, that you see as poor today will stay remorselessly poor year after year. Um, so again, this is Stephen's analysis of, of BHPS. Um, the period on the left is the period 91 to 98. And you'll see that in that period, about a tenth of the people who were poor in 1991 stayed poor for either seven, eight, or nine years of the, of, of the total nine years. Um, I'm glad to say that in the, in the following period, the proportion of the sample who stay persistently poor in these terms um, fell in the period between 98 uh, up to 98 to 2006. So being poor recurrently or, persist or, or persistently is much less common than being poor for shorter spells. There's another side of that, though, which is that if you see it's only half of children in either period who weren't in a family that was that avoided... <laughs> Please turn your mobiles to silence. Um, 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 or somebody, actually, maybe somebody's correcting the figures. Um, um, let me just get rid of this um, before it does it again. Um, okay. Please do the same to yours. Okay. Um, what this shows is that half of children were touched by poverty at one time or another. So the flip side of the being lot, a lot of variation is that many more of us go through these problems. However, uh, it's not random. And the message, the very difficult message to take away from this is that we don't live in a random world, but we do live in a world where where people starts from does affect their, their chances. Um, one of the things that particularly affects their chances and will increasingly affect their chances are differences in wealth. Um, this is what the Osborns had got to um, in terms of their wealth by, um, by the year 2010. Um, they, remember, they don't live in London. And remember that Stephen has been working in the private sector rather than having a public sector um, defined benefit pension. So his, neither their house nor their pension rights are as valuable as some other um, professionals would be. But their wealth added up to £2.1 million um, in 2010. And that put them just on the edge of the top 10% of higher professional workers. So they're not by any stretch the richest. And I thought they don't live in London. Um, Contrast that with the position Jim and Tracy were in um, by 2010. Uh, they don't own their, 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 uh, their flat. Um, they had, they've got possessions. The Office of National Statistics counts personal possessions, furniture, clothes, every, their, their car, in all of this. They had got £6,000 in a building society account, um, which came from a, a, small net, a small legacy that, um, that Tracy had received. Uh, giving them uh, net wealth, total net wealth, of £16,000. Now, that may not seem a very big number, but half of all council tenants aged 55 to 64 had net wealth, including all their possessions, of £16,000 or less in 2010. Uh, now, on the way to getting there, the tax system will have helped Stephen Osborne and me accumulate um, his pension rights through tax reliefs and the right of a tax-free lump sum. Their money is invested in ISAs, in he was involved in something called the business expansion scheme at one point. Their house, they do pay council tax, um, but they don't pay any other tax on the capital gains they've benefited from, or indeed the value of living in their own house tax-free. By contrast, the Ackroyds were very lucky that when Jim lost his job, and they had Tracy's next egg of £6,000 in a building society account, 
The year before he lost his job, that would have started ruling them out from getting benefits because of the capital rules in benefits. The year, luckily for him, the year it happened, they increased the, the, um, the cut-off to £16,000, um, which is where it stayed since then. But, but in that case, saving can be bad news in terms of how the state um, treats you. Um, now, these are considerable amounts of money, and the fact that the state has been helping this generation accumulate wealth is, of course, the, one of the factors behind what we see and what we often hear about in terms of the difference in wealth between the baby boomers, people like me, uh, aged between 55 and, and 64, and what's sometimes called the jilted generation. So what I've done here is to take the um, ONS Wealth and Asset Survey numbers for wealth um, by age of household head. Uh, he's also, properly speaking, household reference person again. And the black line, if you can see that there, you'll see peaks at about £400,000. That the, the typical, the median middle household, age 55 to 64, had, if you add everything together, including their pension rights, which of course are at their highest just before they retire, had wealth of um, £400,000 in, um, in uh, 2010. Um, that contrasts, if you compare it, and I, some people in, in the audience, I'm sure, people aged 25 to 34, born 30 years later, that so far their wealth, um, adding everything up, a little bit of housing equity, um, some small pension rights, a little bit of savings, um, would add, uh, plus some possessions and stereos and, and all of that stuff, um, would add up to um, about um, somewhere about £50,000. Now that gap between £400,000 and £50,000, to, to accumulate that over 30 years to catch up with their parents would require somebody on average earnings to save 50% of every single penny they earned. And it's not going to happen. In fact, we know it's not happening because we know from research at the Institute of Physical Studies and elsewhere that that generation, in fact, is not saving. Uh, in many ways, uh, because it's, it's become poorer than its predecessors, uh, it can't. But the other thing that you see from this diagram, which the, the case of the Ackroyd and, and Osborns illustrates, is that it's not helpful to think about the baby boomers in a lump and the jilted generation in their early 30s in a lump, because there's huge variation between them. Just as of that variation between um, Stephen and Henrietta and Jim and Tracy, you see the, that, that variation at national scale between the, the red line at the bottom, which is a cutoff for the poorest tenth, um, up to the top, um, the top uh, 90, 90%, um, the, 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 the top 10% in purple at the top there. But the other side of that is that this wealth, not the pensions, but other parts, or actually in future, some of the pensions as well, that wealth which is currently in the older groups on the left, won't vanish when they die. It will probably pass as an inheritance to the baby boomers, who already, many of them, and particularly the ones who are likely to inherit, have houses, have pension rights, who will then pass that on to help the grandchildren get on the housing ladder, to help them do the unpaid internships, to do master's degrees at universities for which there isn't funding, and, and so on, and all the things you need to get, uh, to get on, on the ladder. And that kind of thing means that the advantage you see in one generation moves on through an, an even longer wavelength to what we see in the next generation. So moving on to the next generation, um, what's going to happen to George and Edward? Um, well, if Edward's family, parents, are in the top fifth of the income distribution, which they are, you would expect him to be 60% on average up the scale um, in terms of assessment uh, when he goes into primary school. Whereas you expect George, um, coming from the poorest fifth of families, to be a th only a third of the way up that scale. As it goes on through, um, through, um, through school, 83% um, of children not on free school meals get to level four in their SATs at the age of 11, but only two thirds of children who are on free school meals. By the age of 16, um, you might expect to see Edward 62% up the GCSE range, but George only 33% of the way up it. And the same in terms of A-level achievement and, and similar differences when you think of who goes on to higher education. 
and also when you start looking at who goes to universities like the LSE um, or other Russell Group universities where you see even if you've got through to A-levels, two-thirds of those who've gone to private school uh, will go on to Russell Group universities as opposed to 24% um, of state school children. Um, now, I want to come back to these numbers in a moment, but just bear in mind that these are averages. Um, but just to see what this looks like on an international scale, some of you, I, I hope, will have heard of something now known as the Great Gatsby Curve. What this work, this is work by Miles Korak, a Canadian um, economist uh, writing in the Journal of Economic Perspectives. Um, this takes the evidence we've got on how the earnings of children, and these are all focused because that, the data available is focused on men, these, this relates, looks at how closely related the earnings of sons are in different countries to the earnings of their fathers when they were growing up. So the vertical line there goes up to 0.5. In other words, for the countries where we have least social mobility, in this sense, Italy, the United Kingdom and the United States, about half of people's earnings in their 30s can be predicted by what their, um, parent, what their father was earning when they were children. Now that's what happens in the more unequal countries on the right of the diagram, because along the other axis I've plotted income inequality, the Gini coefficient of, of, um, of, of income distribution. Um, if you, that contrasts with the Scandinavian countries on the left-hand side, which are both more unequal, are both more equal in terms of today's income distribution, but also there's less link between what happens to sons um, and what happens to children. Now, why does that happen? I think there are two easy ways of describing that. One is that if the ladder if the rungs of the ladder are further apart, and that's certainly now true of wealth, it's a great deal more difficult to climb up it through your own efforts um, than, it, than, it, than it would be in a more equal country. So that's the climbing up point is more difficult in a more unequal country. But I think there's another factor as well, and that is that if you are at the privileged end of an unequal society, you know that it's a long way down you know what might happen to your children and your grandchildren if they slip down that ladder. And I think many parents and grandparents in that situation will fight like tigers to make sure that their children do not slip down a ladder that goes such a long way down. And not just that, they've got the resources to do that, to buy the schools and the catchment areas of the right schools, to help with all the things that, that help um, move people through life. Now, but... Think of, there's another thought about this diagram, and it applies to everything I've been saying about the dynamics of people's lives. Yes, there are these links, but they're not deterministic. Averages aren't destiny. So that it may be true that about half of the earnings of men in their 30s a few years ago were related to the earnings of their father, but the other half wasn't. If we look at the year-to-year -year income data, um, it's true that um, there's a lot of variation um, and, but where you start from has, a, uh, means you're, has an influence on where you're going to end up. If you start off poor, you're more likely to end up poor. If you start off rich, you're more likely to end up rich. Now, that's a very complicated kind of world to grasp because it's a world in which it's not random. That would be nice and easy because then it would all even itself out in the end. But nor is it rigid, which would be nice and easy, because we would then say, well, this is the people with, these are the people with problems, and we can decide to help them or not help them. It would be them and us. It's this much more complicated in-between world where there is movement, but where you start, where you start, um, where, where you start um, uh, matters. And that's far harder to formulate policy towards. OK, let me just finish by a couple of things that try and bring um, this up to date a bit. Um, so towards the end of the book, I look at what the effect of the bigger changes, not in, just in people's lives, but, but in the economy and what effect they've had on people and how different people have been affected by austerity, tax rises, benefit cuts, and so on over the last, um, over the last um, few years. Um, so what I've done is to compare what's happened to the most affluent of the families illustrated in the book, um, Stephen and Henry Osborne, 
and what's happened to them um, in terms of how the tax and benefit system treats them today, 2014-15, compared with how it would have treated them under the May 2010 system, the, election, the system that was in place at the time of the general election, if we'd just adjusted all the values in that benefit levels, tax thresholds and so on, in line with, um, in line with inflation as measured by the consumer price index. Uh, now, of course, things haven't happened quite like that. Um, for instance, the income, personal income tax allowance has gone up much faster than, um, than, than price inflation. If you look at that, um, Stephen Osborne um, is very well paid. Uh, before you allow for his uh, pension contributions, which bring down his taxable pay, he's on about £96,000 a year. Um, he's paying a little less in national insurance. And he's paying a bit more um, than uh, in, um, uh, in income tax. Um, Henrietta actually is paying less income tax and less national insurance contributions. She's a part-time teacher. She spends a bit of time um, each week looking after their, their granddaughter. Um, but um, she's, um, uh, she's a big winner from the personal allowance going up to £10,000 compared with what it was before. Um, they're paying less council tax because their council tax, or at least the part of it, the, uh, the East Cheshire part of their council tax, rather than the other precepts, has been frozen um, over the last four years. Um, but they are paying more VAT because the VAT on what they purchase is now at 20% rather than 17.5%. If you add all of that up, the net position for somebody like Stephen and Henrietta, and indeed for people like LSE professors, um, is that they've lost about £638. They're paying more than they would have done under the old system each year. That's about £12.20 a week. It's about 0.7% of their disposable income. Um, that contrasts with the poorest member of the, of, of the families, Michelle Ackroyd. Remember, she's earning about £123 a week. Her child benefit has been frozen. It's fallen down. It's fallen in real terms. Um, her child tax credit has actually gone up a bit. Uh, there was a bit where it went up faster than inflation. On the other hand, her working tax credit has been cut back severely. So overall, she's lost £4.50 a week in terms of her tax credits. Her housing benefit has been cut. She's now contributing more to her council tax. Salford Council today asks, however poor you are, you have to pay 12.5% of, of your council tax bill, even if you're on income support. Michelle's better off than that, so she pays more, but she's still lost as a result of, 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 of the way um, in which um, council tax benefit has been transformed into council tax support. She's actually quite lucky. In other parts of the country, um, people have to pay at least 20% of their, um, in one part of North London, 30% of their council tax bill. Um, and she's also paying higher VAT. If you add all of that up, for somebody on her income, she's losing £14.27 a week. She's actually losing more in cash terms than the Osbournes are. And that's 6% of her income, um, nine times as much as a share of her income. Now, that's meant that diagrams like this rather puzzle me. This is, uh, this is, I don't want to be unfair to IFS, because the Treasury produced exactly the same kind of diagram. We often see what the effects of austerity have been compared with what happens if you start from January 2010. And if you do that, you see a picture that looks like this. This is percentage losses from all tax changes, so including indirect taxes, direct taxes, and the benefit changes, with the poorest tenth losing 4.5% of their income since January 10, compared with a, um, keeping everything going in, in terms of prices. But at the top, and, and you see it's, it's what's technically called regressive. The, the higher you go up the income distribution, um, the, the less people are losing, until you get to the top. Now, that's a, that was a puzzle to me, because Stephen Osborne is in the top 10%, but he's not losing. He and, and, and Henrietta aren't losing 6.5% of their income. Now, there are three reasons for that. And just to advertise, we're publishing a paper next week which goes into some of this in, in, in a lot more detail. But, Remember that Stephen was earning £96,000. The big changes affect people earning over £100,000, over £150,000, people who are well within the top 2 or 3% of, of the income distribution. And, but because those people, the ones even higher up, earn so much money, the fact that they're paying higher rate tax, which is now 45% rather than 40%, um, that swamps the effect of the rather smaller losses of people like um, Stephen, Henrietta, or people like me. 
um, producing part of the reason why you see a di diagram like this. You also, and we'll talk about this more next week, um, a lot of this has to do with whether you, where, you, where you start, what date you start this at. Okay, let me finish um, in the last um, few minutes. Um, all of this, I think, suggests that the world is really rather different from the way it's sometimes presented to us in terms of them, an unchanging group of people who get everything out of the system, and us, an unchanging group um, who pay uh, money into it. But that's not the way it's discussed generally in public um, or in politics. Um, what we hear about is the escalating cost of welfare. Um, in that them and us sense. And some of you may have seen, some of you may even have received, has anybody received their taxpayer statement? Okay, so at some point, some of you in the audience will receive your taxpayer statement. Some of you may have seen this in the papers. Um, I personally think this is a very good idea. I think telling people where their tax is going and illustrating where it's going um, is a very good idea. And you will get a personalised statement. If you've paid £5,842 of income tax and national insurance contributions, you will get a, a diagram like this and it will have pounds around it showing where it's gone. So at the top you actually see this rather small sliver which is the UK contribution to the EU budget. Um, I'm not sure whether that was calculated before or after George Osborne halved it. Um, and then you see another small sliver for overseas aid and a, a distressingly small sliver for the environment um, and culture and so on. And then the red part there is defence. And we all get, and then national debt interest. And state pensions and education and health. And then you see this big orange slab labelled welfare. That where the money is going, a quarter of the money is going to welfare. And that's even after you've taken out the state pensions, education and the health service. Now, I think the Treasury could have produced a diagram that um, looked more like this. You could have said that two-thirds of spending is going on the welfare state. If you added up the NHS, education, housing, personal social services, social security and tax credits, you would get two-thirds, you would say, was being spent on the welfare state. Indeed, sometimes the numbers, if you really want to be frightening about the numbers, you say, we are spending £489 billion on the welfare state this year. And then you go on to talk about um, the scroungers and, and so on. Um, now, but that's the bit in orange I've got there is the whole Social Security budget. Um, I've added on, and then you see in red, the cost of tax credits. If you go back to the Treasury diagram, what's included in welfare there is all of personal social services. It's judges' pensions. Um, it's, um, OK, it doesn't include state pensions, but it includes um, all other pensioner benefits. Um, it includes um, all benefits for people of working age who are at work. Um, if you break this down a little bit further and say, well, what we're really worried about when we're using the term welfare is about out-of-cash benefits that are being paid to out-of-work families, that's about 5% of the budget. In all, it's um, the, the, the total amount spent on cash benefits to out-of-work people who are of working age is one pound in every £12.50 of what we spend on the welfare state. And within that pound, only 20p is spent on unemployment benefits and, um, and housing benefit going to unemployed people. Because the out-of-work families also include people who are sick and disabled of working age and, and lone parents. So you could have had a scary diagram that highlighted welfare, in the sense it's often used, as being the orange um, sliver um, there. Now, so one side of this is that not so much of our money is being spent where we think it's spent. However, the public don't believe that. In a recent survey, and um, my colleague Ben Baumberg is, is here in the audience who was involved with this, um, the median belief is that 40% of the Social Security and tax credit budget, even when it's been described to them as where the money is going, 40% of that is believed to go on benefits to unemployed people. It's actually a tenth of that. It's 4%. Um, and as I said, all welfare payments to those of working age are less than £1 in every £12.50. But at the same time, the average belief when you ask people what share of all that Social Security and tax credit spending is claimed fraudulently, it's more than a quarter. 
um, that 27 per cent of all benefits, including pensions, um, are claimed fraudulently. Now, for that to happen, there are an awful lot of children who are having child benefit claimed for who don't really exist, and or alternatively, there are some pensioners around who have cunningly lied about their age and shouldn't be getting their pension. Um, that £58 billion is 50 times DWP's estimate based on detailed assessment, I hope it's detailed assessment, of random cases. So if you take the DWP's numbers, people think that fraud of unemployment benefit accounts for about a tenth of all Social Security spending. DWP thinks it's a thousandth, and yet that's where the focus is. But those kind of myths, and this is really the end of the book and the, the point of the book, is that a lot of the debate is, is, is overlaid with this idea that the spending is going on handouts to people who are different from us, and that that's where it mainly goes and that we have no interest in it. Now, I think that the effects of that um, it has two different effects. One is that if we think that so much money is being spent on those handouts, and a lot of it is being fraudulently claimed, there is a huge amount of public support for being tougher on it and for making savings out of it. But if it's actually only a small part of the budget, the only way you can get substantial savings out of that sliver of the budget is by being really tough, by having bedroom taxes, by demanding that people on no income pay the council, part of their council tax, by the amount of sanctioning people having their benefits stop, stopped um, because they've infringed some um, condition um, for one reason or another, sometimes beyond their control, rising from £250,000 a year a few years ago, 250,000 cases a year to 900,000 cases last year. Um, you get the tougher disability test because that's the only way you can squeeze the money out of what's actually a small part of the budget. Um, that's one side, the hardship that results from thinking you can save a lot of money in that direction rather than out of the big parts of the budget, uh, the bits that we, the, the Osbournes and, and many of us in the room, benefit from. But the second side of it is that if we think that's where the problem is and that it's nothing to do with us, then I think we don't face up to the big choices that we have about what are really the big ticket items. As we age as a population and as those costs for pensions, health care, and if we want to compete in the world economy, education rise, which is where the money goes. Um, as I think Spongers illustrated so well 25 years ago, a, a generation ago, and as I hope today's book spells out in a bit more detail, one of the things we have to understand is that this really is one of those areas where we are all in it together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Um, and we now have two uh, very distinguished respondents. Um, first of all, um, we have Polly Toynbee, um, leading columnist in The Guardian, one of the leading columnists in the world, I would say. Um, one of the more intriguing compliments she had was uh, when two Conservative ministers, um, uh, including our present Prime Minister, uh, said that they should be listening, the Conservative Party should be listening to her rather than to Winston Churchill. Um, well, we don't have Winston Churchill with us um, today, but we do have uh, Polly Toynbee. We have the privilege of listening to her. Um, so, Polly, would you like to Thank you. Off? Thank you very much. Um, I just would like to say this is an absolutely terrific book uh, and couldn't be more timely or more necessary. And it's a wonderful blend of having the absolute academic authority and a really good racy read for anybody who's interested at all in the subject, and that's just about everybody. It grabs the myths, and I would say the untruths that are being uh, spread at the moment by the throat um, in an absolutely unanswerable way. Um, 
I think the next election is probably going to be the most dishonest uh, election that we will have seen for a very long time. And everybody should go armed with this. They should buy a copy and give it to the person that they know, relative or neighbour, or possibly even friend, who believes the myths. Uh, and make sure that it gets disseminated as widely as possible. I think the really important messages, which John has, has, has spelled out so clearly about the life cycle. And when you talk to people about the life cycle, a kind of light bulb comes on, and they think, yeah, that's true. As you get older, you use much more. A snapshot in the middle of life uh, looks like a Robin Hood story. It's not like that at all. And this is so well spelled out with such good graphics. Um, I think the fact that half of children are poor at some point, you know, it's not that little group down there. I think that strikes people too uh, and makes them stop and think. The, the idea that people are moving in and out, that um, people aren't, don't stay unemployed for a long time, but they're cycling in and out. As it happens, uh, just this week, another bit of research from the uh, Resolution Foundation has come out looking at over 10 years at the same group of people on low pay and finds that a quarter of them do move up to be about at the median, but two-thirds of them are cycling in and out of low pay all the time. Um, just one in eight very stuck on low pay. So that it does show that wonderful spaghetti diagram that's absolutely unforgettable about people's lives. And when you ask people about their families and to think about everybody they know in their family, the ones who do well, the ones who don't work, do well, and people who've had crises in their lives, again, another sort of light bulb moment of saying, yeah, that's true. When so-and-so got divorced, they had a very hard period. Um, or when you know somebody got sick, these things are very much in people's minds if they can think of life over over a long stretch and across a, a wider a wider family. I do think some of the things that are being that are being said by people who know better really are quite disgraceful. And there's Dean Duncan Smith giving an interview not very long ago to the Sunday Times, one of his favourites, saying, you know, uh, I'm going to t say to everybody that uh, I'm, I'm telling everybody from now on, this is not an easy life anymore, chum. I think you're a slacker. That sort of language uh, applied indiscriminately by implication to anybody on any kind of benefit does such immense, immense damage. Um, I think, you know, when you get Lord Freud saying, another DWP minister, talking about food banks as they've hit uh, a million people a year making use of them, most of those people only you know, for a few weeks each. So again, it shows how, how, just how many people touch into that. Uh, he just said, um, if you put more food banks in, uh, that is the supply. Clearly, food from food banks is, by definition, a free good, and there's almost infinite demand. Knowing, as he must do perfectly well, that the people who go there have to get vouchers, they come from, uh, they come from social workers, they come from doctors, they come from people who know, they come from, uh, very often, from the DWP themselves. I was at one in Whitney the other day in Cameron's own constituency, where the, most of the people sent there are sent from the job centre up the road with a voucher for the job centre, for the, for the food bank, that they have to then find the money to, to, uh, to, to get the food. I mean, are people, and people, you know, are being badly misled? We've seen the, the, the uh, what beliefs people have. You know, are people absolutely impervious to the truth? I don't think so. I think we have to be optimistic that in the end the truth gets out there. And certainly over many years, uh, John Hills's work has done more to do that than anyone else. Um, you know, the facts are there about inequality, and each time he writes about them so eloquently, slicing them this way and that way, uh, they really are so incontrovertible. I mean, I think it's interesting that we saw the research from Oxford, and I'd like to know what you say about this, John, about suggesting that actually now more people are falling down the ladder. There's a research that came out last week. And so when you say people are going to fight like tigers to stop their children falling down the ladder, these are people who 
are themselves professionals, seeing their children falling into non-professional uh, permanent occupations. Well, that might be an almost um, revolutionary situation, you'd think, if they really are going to fight like tigers and will resent it hugely when they see that happen. And again, perhaps make people understand this um, churn that goes on. Uh, being lucky and unlucky happens at different times in your life. So how should we really get all this across? That's the problem. Very often, people on the left of centre talk in terms of statistics and facts and challenge the facts, and what they're confronted with is anecdote. Day after day after day, one picture of a Romanian family put into temporary accommodation with 12 children in some mansion in Kensington will stay in people's minds. You've read it in the Daily Mail for perhaps 10 years, and how many people will have seen it? And they'll say, oh, well, I know who, who these people are on housing benefit really are. Interesting f statistic, that numbers of families with 10 children or more living on benefits is 192. I think they must each appear in the Daily Mail at least once or twice a year. Uh, but that's a very, very low and freakish number. So I think we have to try not to despair. And I think um, politicians have to get better at finding ways to tell the stories on the other side that counteract the freakish anecdotes. And I think we have to live in hope that something like the bedroom tax really has struck people as being profoundly unfair. And I think that really has struck a very strong chord um, and I think the truth will out, and this book will help it, that we are definitely not all in this together. And the uh, Ackroyd's uh, cut of 6% versus the Osborne's cut of 0.7, I think people know that, that uh, this has been an austerity that has hit uh, the many much more than it's hit the few. Stop there. Thank you very much indeed. I think the, uh, the idea behind the Ackroyds and the Osborne's in many ways is to try to counter precisely that, the, the problem of the anecdote. Um, uh, uh, we now have uh, Professor Holly Sutherland, um, who is uh, one of the pioneers, in fact, uh, probably the pioneer, of, uh, of modelling the effects of taxes and benefits um, within the economy. She's currently research professor at the University of Essex and is director of Euromod, not director of the institute, which was, uh, she was labelled earlier on, director of Euromod, which is um, uh, looking at trying to model these, the effects of taxes and benefits across all the countries of the European Union. So she's particularly well um, placed to comment on some of the work that's been going on. And uh, Holly, over to you. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me to, to comment on John's book. I'm particularly delighted because I was one of the people who did some of the backroom calculations on the, not the sponges, but the beat the tax man um, back in 1990, whatever it was. So this is uh, something of a, a, a reunion for me with the Osborns, Osborns and Ackroyds, and of course you two. So that's great. I'm going to try and do two, three things. First, I want to pick out some of the big picture point, points from the book that struck me. Secondly, with my academic hat on, I want to make some comments on the methodology. And third... Since the myth of them and us has important consequences and persists, as John has explained, I think we should do something about it. I don't have a solution, but I have a few suggestions. So the big picture points that uh, I think are important for academic researchers, as well as, of course, normal people, to keep in the back of their minds... Um, I've selected five. There could have been many, many from the book, and I may have put some of my own spin on them, so John can uh, disassociate himself from what I say if he wishes. But first of all, he won't, for the first one, it's not them and us, it's just us. The life cycle picture um, is extremely well justified and motivated in, in the book, and it, that's very important to remember. Secondly, the rich and poor when taken from a life cycle perspective, the rich and poor get about the same amount out of the welfare system in absolute terms. 
but it adds more proportionately to the resources of the poor. But over the life cycle, the rich pay more tax. Well, we'd be very worried if they didn't, but this, that's, it's important to say that on top of the, the, the equal balanced uh, situation for the welfare system. Third, fourthly, equal opportunity is, ne is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for reducing inequality. The size of the gap between the bottom and the top still matters because of the, lar the larger distance there is to fall, the more there is at stake. As John explained, the potential payoff for the rich from buying special provision for their children is larger the larger the distance there is to fall. So it's very hard to increase social mobility if inequality is high, and the same the other way around. So this is self-perpetuating, so that that means that the scale, distribution, and effectiveness of public resources really, really matters. And then finally, cuts in the welfare state on austerity um, have a larger proportional effect at the bottom than at the top, looking at the cross-section, but this surely must also be the case over the life cycle. But in contrast, generally, increases in taxes, certainly proportional increases in taxes, have broadly the same proportional effect across the income distribution. And I'll come back to the idea of whether one should cut benefits or increase taxes at the end. So on the methodology, um, John combines fiction with hard quantitative evidence from many studies, including much of his, his own work over, over 10 years. This fiction is not um, random. It's kind of manipulated fiction. The Ackroyds and the Osbournes have been designed very carefully, I know that, um, <laughs> to illustrate the points that John wants to make. Some of the manipulations are a bit questionable. For example, I mean, this goes back to sponges. This wasn't John's choice in this book, I think. But giving the heart attacks to Stephen rather than Jim, if there's no strong evidence of an income or class gradient in heart attacks, I mean, there may be one a little bit, but there's no strong gradient. So we help to balance the, the welfare spending by giving the heart attacks to, <laughs> to Stephen rather than Jim. Um, that, that's a little bit worrying. However, I mean, this would not be good science if that was all there was to it. But it was it's, all Don's fault. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not all there is to it. Um, and as Polly said, John's use of fictional characters really works. And this is because of the constant references backwards and forwards, reminding us how the sort of soap opera characters and their experiences are only illustrations and how they fit into the bigger picture. This makes the arguments easier to understand easier to read, the book's really easy to read, and which, given the prevailing myths, is a very important thing to do and a very big contribution. It's also transparently done in the book so that one can recalculate for oneself who gets the heart attack and see what difference it makes. I mean, actually, I'm not quite sure about the heart attack itself, <laughs> but you can certainly... Um, see how the calculations were done and think to yourself how the picture would look different if, if different choices had been made. And actually, while I, while I think about it, I think that instead of series four of the Ackroyds and the Osbournes, what this should be is a website, an interactive website that allows people to go in there and make their own changes. It would be a huge amount of work. <laughs> Um, but actually, would therefore, be research funding. And we'd love, we'd, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It would need lots of funding. But actually, I'm serious. It would be um, a, a major contribution to understanding. Included in the analysis uh, is analysis of the effects of austerity, 
um, and the effects of the coalition's tax and benefit changes, not only on the Ackwards and the Osbournes, but also on the population as a whole, drawing on IFS analysis, and John presented that. He mentioned that there will be um, a paper next week that does uh, some more of this, and I'm going to take the opportunity to shamelessly advertise our joint work. Um, it will be published next week. It analyzes the coalition tax benefit changes, taking a range of perspectives, so not only the one that the IFS take, and comes to some new conclusions. So it's a paper coming out of cases, social policy, and the cold climate project, and the paper is called Were We Really All In It Together? Thank you very much. I've actually got well, one more thing to oh, say. <laughs> Sorry. Can I have another couple of minutes? That's all right. uh, yes, yes. I was just, I was just musing on the idea of the video game. I was going to. Yeah, no, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to say something about what we can do about it. If the myth has consequences and the myth persists, we as, as academic researchers need to think of an action plan so we can make a difference. And I don't, I don't have a, a plan that will work. I have a f five ideas that we should some of them completely obvious. The first one is make use of the arguments in the book. Polly's right, give the book to people for Christmas, whatever, make it. <laughs> or you can lend it, um, but get, make sure people read it. The second one sounds facetious, but I think, but has a serious uh, point behind it. Stop using the word welfare in any context. It has too many different meanings and it, that can be manipulated. Find some new words. Thirdly, bring the idea of insurance to the centre stage. I don't necessarily mean social insurance as such, but an understanding of how the insurance function of the welfare state, including tax systems, permits the non-rich to take risks and make choices, so to be more productive and effective than they otherwise could be. This is distinct from the life cycle effect. It's about expectations, choices, and behavior. And John's book certainly touches on this, but it would be really nice to develop a way of measuring it, measuring the insurance effect on behavior, and comparing the UK with elsewhere. Then another thing that there's space for academic research is to try and further understand in order to undermine, I suppose, what causes the myth of them and us and how it's perpetuated. There's a research agenda, I think, for political scientists and sociologists and maybe psychologists rather than economists. But again, it, it cries out for a cross-national comparative approach. And then thinking about the consequences, and maybe in parallel, I think we need to make the case for higher and more progressive taxes. And John's book avoids doing this explicitly, so my question for him is what he thinks about that. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think it is very important to think about what we actually do um, in these circumstances. John, would you just kind of like to respond? There was the point that um, Polly made particularly about the falling down the ladder. Uh, whether the, yes, and also the question that uh, Polly finally okay, well, asked you. I, I have to say I have not yet had a chance to read the, um, the, the, the new research that's come out. Um, that um, Polly was referring to, so I can't speak specifically to that. What I do think is different from the past is what, how social mobility or lack of it feels at a time of slow growth. At a time of some growth where incomes are rising 2% a year, 20 25% a decade, 50% um, a generation, then it, even if you're slipping a bit down the ladder, you're still probably going to feel you're better off than your parents, and certainly a lot better off than your grandparents. And of course, if you're doing better than your parents, um, and you've had the growth, you're stupendously better off. If, on the other hand, you're flatlining in terms of income, of, of average incomes, let alone being 6% down on where they were um, um, five years ago, or six years ago, 
um, then any slip down is compounding that and will feel a lot worse. And I think some of the numbers about, you know, will this be the first generation that's poorer than its parents? Well, it may not be that, that there's so much difference in the up and down and the variation and the continuity between generations. But if actually there's not very much change in living standards over a prolonged period, which we've certainly now had 10 years of, and in terms of, of, of average income it started in 2002, not in 2007, to 2003, so we've now had 11 years of it, and America's experience for a lot longer, then that, the normal ups and downs will feel a lot more painful for some. So I think that's, uh, that's part of that. But, I, but I'm afraid I have to read the paper um, before I can c comment more. Um, well, where does this leave us? Um, as um, Chapter 8 of the book talks about, if the big items that we spend money on are health and pensions, and we are an aging population and we are increasing state pension ages only relatively slowly, I mean, maybe in line with now, from now on, in line with life expectancy, those expensive bits of the welfare state are going to get more expensive. And we quite like the health service, and we've also been through a long period where we thought it was a very bad idea to have pensions that were increasingly only means-tested and were, in terms of the, the basic state pension, cut to the bone. Um, so I'm not sure that as a society, if we have the choice we put in front of us, we will want to be spending less on health care as we grow older, certainly not less on social care as we grow older, and probably not less on pensions as we grow older, remembering that we have one of the least generous state pension systems in the industrialised world. Um, now, if there's not much less elsewhere to cut only a third of the rest of public spending is non-welfare state spending. And if the reality of the handouts to people who are unpopular is actually relatively small orange slivers, that leaves us, the only way of squaring that circle is to increase taxes. And if we live in the fifth most unequal um, country in the industrialised world, it would seem to me, just as a, an individual, a personal point of view, that it would be fair if those taxes were raised progressively, both in terms of people's incomes and in terms of their wealth, given the huge wealth variations we've seen. So it seems to me that... But, but that's just the conclusion I draw from putting those particular things together. If there are bits of that chain of logic that people disagree with, then they wouldn't reach the same conclusion. Thank you. Well, we have um, a few minutes uh, for um, questions. Um, so... Over to you, and I think we've already got a question from the front there. Thank you. Could you just say who you are? My name's John McArdle. I'm from the Black Triangle Disability Rights Campaign, which is a, a grassroots disabled people's organization based in Scotland. Um, I mean, something that hasn't really been mentioned too much here is that um, austerity has been an absolute catastrophe for disabled people. Um, you know, we're talking about hundreds of people who have lost their lives through it, you know, well documented in the media. Um, according to the DWP's own figures, in 2011 alone, 10,600, according to a Freedom of Information request, people died within six months, six weeks, I beg your pardon, of being found fit for work by DWP Atos. Now, do, do you have a particular question? A particular question is this, which is tying in, I, you know, and I thank you for your contribution to this debate. I think it's marvellous. But um, for four and a half years, uh, our organisation, Disabled People Against Cuts, has been fighting tooth and nail to um, give a counter-narrative to all of this propaganda about scroungers and so on. The question is, uh, as I don't know whether it was Lenin, was it, what is to be done? And what I would like to ask you, Polly, is what is the Labour Party going to do it? Because I can tell you that uh, the reason why in Scotland 45% of people voted um, for independence to have nothing to do with Westminster is because of social justice. And this is only going to increase. Now, the Labour Party are not delivering. How do we solve this problem? How do we save our welfare state? Because our welfare state is being destroyed. And George Osborne has said that there's going to be another £30 billion of cuts. You know, this has just got to stop, and, and it's all about power. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Polly, do you want to respond to... I don't particularly want to respond on behalf of the Labour Party. I'm not... Um, 
you know, I, I, I'm not a politician. I don't have to defend them. I actually think that it will make, would make an enormous difference as to whether there is a Labour or Conservative government in power next time. Uh, I have absolutely no doubt about that at all, and I hope that people in Scotland will concentrate their minds on who they send to Westminster in terms of making sure that we don't get a Conservative government. But that's my view. I would like to take up something, though, which relates to this, and something that Holly said, too, about what do we do? What do we do? And what, perhaps, do academics do? And I know that, at the moment, you know, that they're doing a lot to rebut, but it's almost as if, between now and the election... There should be a committee of the most distinguished academics uh, who are ready to rebut instantly on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, the IFS does it very well, and they've been very good and tough about, for instance, that disgraceful pie chart that's being sent out, and they were quick off the mark, and they do those the fiscal things. But it would be pretty good if, you know, John and a handful of other, an awful lot of you are here were ready, absolutely, finger on the button for the next six months at every time somebody, some politician talked casually about, I'm really in favour of social mobility. They're ready to ping back and say, here are the facts, here are why it's not happening, here is why it's not going to happen unless you have a more or equal society. Just facts and figures constantly at the ready. I think that would make a difference. I think that it would be you know, a group of people who would be referred to by at least by the broadcasters. I mean, 80% of the press you're going to get nowhere with, but, you know, the Financial Times, the Independent, the Guardian, um, the others maybe have, you know, got their fingers in their ears. But um, I think that sort of wall of um, expertise could make a lot of difference. Thank you. John, did you want well, to...? I think just to, to reinforce, um, I, I have to confess that um, the book talks about... Um, disability and about movements on and off disability benefits and points to the way in which both there is much more change in whether people receive benefits over time than I think some people suppose, but also the problems caused for running the system by things like fluctuating conditions, particularly mental health conditions and so on, where people may look okay the day they go to Atos, um, but aren't most of the time and aren't necessarily an attractive prospect for employers. But I think the, the, the kind of real point is that the change that's happened in the last five years, which I find really quite remarkable, is that 15 years ago, it would have been... The, 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 the effect of threatening cuts to disability benefits were people chaining themselves in their wheelchairs to the gates of Downing Street and things like that, that, that captured a lot of, of public sympathy, because at that point... The stigma had not spread from people who were out of work to people who were, collect, who, who were entitled to sickness and disability benefits. I think the big change is that um, there's now a much wider group of people who are perceived to being in the undesirable um, welfare um, recipients class and are therefore in the firing line for this attempt to raise large amounts of savings from what's actually a small slice of the budget. And that then leads to, along with the sanctioning, along with the bedroom tax and so on, um, the much more severe um, tests that we've seen administered by Atos and, and others. Uh, because you have to be stricter and stricter to make significant savings out of what's not really a big part of the overall budget in the big scheme of things. Can I just give an illustration of that, in that the DWP put out uh, in the last year a press release, and it went out on a, fr a Saturday for the Sunday papers, but it only went to certain papers, to their friendly papers. It never came to The Guardian or to the FT or The Independent. And it was simply a list of eight anecdotes of people who were cheating, pretending to be disabled. Somebody caught running a marathon in a roofer fund, you know, who claimed that he had a bad back. Uh, those stories, of course, there are always going to be some. We know there's some fraud, but we also know, as John's book says, how little it is. But this was, you know, a deliberate list of anecdotes with no statistics, whatever, put out just to its friendly newspapers, di a deliberate sort of exoset against the reputation of people with disabilities drawing any kind of benefit. And we have to recognise that's what we're up against. It's not ac accidental. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, I'm sorry. We don't, we don't let other people in. Um, yes. Um. 
So the book is kind of substantiating something that I think a lot of people on the left kind of had a hunch about, though. Even if it's put to us now with statistics and stuff backing us up, I think a lot of people kind of know that over the course of your life, you're probably getting back more from the state than you put in. The problem is, I think, that the left aren't necessarily that good at shouting about it. Like, we've kind of known all this stuff all along, but it's... Like you say, it's in The Guardian. It's not shared as widely in the other papers. It's in places like the Joseph Rountree Foundation bulletins every Friday, but it's not in a lot of other places. Do you think a part of that is because, actually, we've tried... And Polly's just said we should try and get academics together, give it a lot of backing and so on. But do you think a part of the problem is that because the left is so nuanced and so kind of here's a picture but it's complicated, it's actually very hard to sell the left-wing point of view to people who want an easy read and therefore an easy victim or easy thing to blame? I'll take two or three questions and then uh, invite responses from the panel. Yes, in the middle there. Hi, my name's uh, Stephen Ayres. I'm with the House Commons Library. I'm a statistician. And um, the way that I see it is there are, um, there are two sort of major myths in current sort of policy discourse. Uh, one of those, as you've drawn attention to with this book, is welfare, and the other is immigration. Um, you've uh, sort of drawn upon this idea of us and them, and the way that I see it, I think we're in danger of kind of slipping into uh, extending this sort of us and them uh, Categories, I suppose, into a sort of um, sort of two by two kind of matrix of us and them, and then insiders and outsiders. Um, and in the British election study uh, data, there's um, uh, figures actually show that people with the least favourable attitudes uh, towards uh, immigration also have the least favourable attitudes towards uh, welfare spending. And I wondered how you kind of see that through this sort of scope of this book. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, evening, Angus Hanton, Intergenerational Foundation. I know that John would like us to rename ourselves the Intergenerational and, and Social Inequality Foundation, which we haven't done yet. But I thought John's description of how we're becoming a much more feudal society where our life chances depend on those of our parents w was brilliant. Um, and... Uh, personally, I'm convinced that the oldies, that's us, the baby boomers, have robbed our children. But actually, we haven't robbed our own children. It's we've robbed our children's contemporaries. Um, we've done very, we do very well for our own children. My question relates to John's life cycle graph, where he shows younger people tending, working age tending to pay in and older ones tending to take out a lot more, as you would expect. But with longer life expectancies, it seems to me that this this is becoming a bit unsustainable. So my question is, um, is the intergenerational contract under threat? Thank you. John, would you care to respond to some of those points? OK, um, we might then have to... And then we might get thrown out of the room shortly after that. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think it is difficult in terms of getting the message across because part of the message of what we know from the research is that it's complicated. And it's always harder to get across a message with two phrases to it than a message with one phrase for it. And I think I'm not... The, you know, the, the, the people we need to be articulating that this are people who can convey those nuances, but, um, but in, a, in, a, in a way that everybody lat latches onto. And maybe in this, I think there's, there is some hope in the fact that actually there's a kind of cognitive dissonance between what many people believe in terms of what they read in the press and what's then reflected back to them by politicians who, are, who, who want to be seen as being on the side of what most people believe, and therefore it reinforces itself, is that that actually jars with what we all know from our own lives. I mean, I was going to start this, um, but I didn't have enough time, with, with just an account of what had happened in the archers over the last eight months. <laughs> um, or, or, or EastEnders or whatever, or, but, or indeed in anybody's lives, because we know that we are going through this kind of thing in our own lives. We know that things change. So the person who will capture this most effectively will be the person who relates the big policy issues to what people know from their own experience and those of their family and friends, and the realisation that they're not atypical, that it's, it's all like that. 
Um, I couldn't agree more about um, but there was a big hole in the book about immigration. I'm sure somebody who read a draft of it said you need a lot more on immigration. I'm afraid that with no more words. Um, but the very interesting Mori um, piece, I think, which contrasts people's beliefs about immigration with the reality. You've probably seen that. And what we've got in the audience, um, Jonathan Portis from the National Institute for Economic and Social Research, who've been doing, um, along with people at University College London, a lot of work on this, and it's another area. But I think that Mori thing, which sets up the um, what people believe against the reality, is <coughs> worth looking at. And, I mean, Angus, we've talked about this before, and it's, 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 it's the inter- and intra-generational foundation, I think you should rename yourselves as. Um, yes, it is changing with, with longer life expectancies, and I mean, there are some, some lucky winners in this. I mean, it's a long time since we did this work where we tried to, um, another, anybody wanting to fund some research, we could have another go at it. Um, um, there is a group, I think, and it is, um, if you take us on average, people of my age, where it, it's, we've got ahead of the game, um, I think the generation behind us, it'll even out more. I mean, in the long run, these things do even out, I believe. And I, I don't think there's an ultimate threat to the system because it would be bonkers for the people who've paid all the money in to suddenly say, let's call the game off. Because at that point, they're going to have to fend for themselves, but they're not going to turn around and say that their parents and grandparents are going to get nothing out of it. So you get, you'd get this. Once we're into this pay-as-you-go system, it's very hard to step out of it. But you can make it fairer between generations, but in particular, I think, you need to make it fairer within generations. Thank you, John. I'm afraid we'll have to um, close it there. Um, I remember when um, Sponges was first advertised uh, in the press. Um, in one of the newspapers, it was actually a, uh, advertised as a misprint. Instead of a, being about the welfare state, it was described as being about the wefare state. Um, and in fact, um, uh, but in some ways, that's rather appropriate. And the message that, w that Sponges was trying to give, and the, spon and the message that uh, uh, that John's book um, is trying to put across is that we are all beneficiaries of the welfare state um, and we are all involved. Uh, it's not a question of skivers versus, uh, um, versus the, the hard-working families. Um, we are all involved and um, in, if we wish to defend the welfare state, John has provided us with massive um, ammunition uh, to do so. Um, just now there is a reception outside. Um, we've been asked to let John escape first so that he can uh, go to the, uh, the, uh, the book table. Um, so um, in the meantime, um, thank you all very much for coming. And um, do join us with a glass of wine outside. And perhaps you would express our thanks to um, our respondents. Thank you.